And morning has broken. This is a new day, a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is also the Lord's day. This is Sunday. But this is also a special, not quite holiday, but it's a special day of observance. Does anybody know what this third Sunday, July 15th, is today? What special day this is? There you go. Thank you, Rod. National Ice Cream Day. Blessed Macarios. Woo! It is National Ice Cream Day. Surprising to some, this president is the person to thank for designating the third Sunday of July as National Ice Cream Day and July all month as National Ice Cream Month. Can anybody guess? And if you just have the conviction to just shout it out if you know what president it was that declared that. President Baskin Robbins. Not President Baskin Robbins. Ronald Reagan, that's right, way back in 1984, the year that I graduated from high school. Now, some, that, that, that puts it into perspective, does it not? There you go, 1984, he declared uh, this national holiday to commemorate a treat enjoyed by over 90% of the nation's population and produced by 10% of the nation's milk supply. In fact, Americans consume more ice cream than any other nation in the world. And when President Reagan's proclamation was officially signed into law, it it really, this, this is a law today, okay? So he also called on the U.S. people to pay tribute to ice cream with, quote, appropriate ceremonies and activities. Since then, it's been one of the most coveted holidays that sparked a tasty tradition celebrated year after year. So get out your scoopers, because it's time to delight in some ice cream. According to President Reagan, today, at least today, on National Ice Cream Day, it is your civic duty to eat ice cream. Okay? So, without further ado, just a little bit of a survey of ice cream eating in America. Now, you don't have to admit to this if you don't want to, but some of you will might need to confess this. 40% of people have eaten an entire pint in one city. Okay, so confession is good for the soul. So those are, you know, and if you've eaten more than one pint in more than one sitting and it happened more than one, there you go, amen. 24% eat ice cream to feel better when they're sad. What do you do that? Yesterday was National Macaroni and Cheese Day. We had Stouffer's mac and cheese last night. I, I will tell you that I'm a, I'm a stress eater, so mac and cheese, ice cream, it does not matter. 22% have eaten it to feel better after a breakup. 9% have cried while they were eating ice cream. Just say, maybe it was after the breakup. I don't know. 16% have gotten sick from eating too much ice cream. I see a couple of hands. They're not really raised very high, but I see a couple of hands back there. 13% of people say they're lactose intolerant, but still eat ice cream anyway. It's just that good. 9% have used ice cream to end an argument. I like that. That's a good way to end it. Let's go for some ice cream. I don't like that. And finally, 7% have canceled plans to stay home and just eat ice cream. Well, we love ice cream to be sure, but what are our favorite flavors of ice cream. So if this is your flavor, we'll start with number 10. You can just raise your hand. Let's see if we're representative. And if you just like all kinds, you can just raise. Chocolate chip, 4%. Okay. 5%, Rocky Road. You Own it. If, you, if that's your favorite, own it. 5%. I'm not a big fan of this one. Pistachio. Okay, that's absolutely universal. Like, ugh. Six percent. I think we'll get some strawberry. Okay, now we're now we're getting there. Six percent chocolate chip cookie dough. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Eight percent mint chocolate chip. I'm I'm surprised because that those two tastes don't taste great together for me. I don't know about that. Reese's peanut butter cup. That would be. That's not one on here, but I. 8% cookies and cream. 
Okay. 11% butter, pecan or pecan, depending on... All right. 13% just plain old vanilla. All right. And of course, the number one, which is my favorite too, 14%, chocolate. Woo! Now, how many of you, that was not any of your favorite? You got, got some other favorite. All right. And how many of you, wouldn't matter what was put in front of you. There you go. Okay. Here, favorite, favorite brand for women? What, what do you think favorite ice cream brand? Manuf I, I think I heard it over here. No? Made in Vermont, I believe. Ben and Jerry's. Weight, weight Watchers. Let me just say this, Karen. You'll know that. Bless your heart. There you got that. <laughs> All right. Men, favorite brand? Anything that's on sale. I like that. There you go. Briar, Briars, it actually is Briars, but I like right Anything that's on sale. I, I like that. That is good. Well, you know, how, how much ice cream we're supposed to eat in one sitting? That's it. What? That doesn't count, Mark, but that, yeah. You have about five of these spoonfuls right there, and you got it. That's half a cup. That's all it is. If you, if you look on the label of your ice cream, if you got it, half a cup is all it is for one serving. Now, I usually do it about times three or four of a serving, but that's not good. You know, how in the world could anybody just eat half a cup of ice cream in one sitting? It just, it doesn't seem right, does it? But you know the alternative, if you eat a pint at a time and you do that more than once every so often, you have to get new clothes and new wardrobe. But what, what one word might come to mind to help in being able to just limit yourself to one half a cup serving of ice cream? <laughs> that's, not, that's not, it's another D word, but that's not it. That's not, that's a, complete, that's a completely different sermon. That's not well, I heard it. Discipline. Discipline. There you go. Discipline. Oh, boo, hiss. Nobody like discipline. What are you talking about? Nobody likes discipline. Nobody wants to have discipline like that. It just, it just takes all the fun out of eating ice cream. It just, discipline. Just think about that word. In our American context particularly, Discipline has gotten a bad rap, but discipline, particularly for the child of God, discipline, particularly for followers of Christ, is not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing for our good and for our well-being. So this morning, as we think about that word discipline, really you might have the word chastisement in Scripture, discipline, correction training. You see, discipline really is correction plus punishment, but it's all wrapped on, into one, and it's for a purpose. And it's really to train men and women, boys and girls, that we might follow Jesus Christ, that we might be more conformed to his image. And so this morning, as we think about discipline, and we think about the discipline that sometimes comes into our life from our Heavenly Father, and how we respond to that discipline. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to go ahead and be turning to the New Testament book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. As the writer of Hebrews will share with us this morning, I'll bless you about the opportunity that we have to respond to God's discipline. You know, today is not just National Ice Cream Sunday, 
But today also happens to be uh, my dad's birthday. He, he would have been 83 uh, where he's still alive today. And so July 15th doesn't always fall on a Sunday. And so just happened to coincide both with National Ice Cream Sunday, my, my dad's birthday. And as I thought about that word discipline, I, I thought about the discipline that I received growing up as the son of Dixie and Peggy Scott. And the discipline that I got uh, w- was kind of old school. So my dad was old school. Some, sometimes people discipline and they, they give time out. Nothing wrong with time out. Uh, sometimes people give discipline with taking away uh, things or uh, curtailing your uh, freedoms and putting you on probation or grounding you. N- nothing wrong with that. But my dad had a, a much, shall we say, simpler and more effective method of discipline. And that, that was simply to, and I knew, especially if he had a coat on, that this was not going to be good. Because I will say that 99% of the time, I deserved the discipline that I got. And it's when he did this job. See, he was a funeral director. And so he wore suits most of the time, and he would take off his coat. Some of you are already nodding because you know that something's wrong, Monsieur. Something's wrong because then he went for this. And I'm not going to take my belt off because you don't, you don't want to see that. But I got my coat off, so I think I'm just going to leave the coat off for now. And. and I don't know, but it it seemed like the belt was about this wide. And then when the belt got doubled up, whoo, and I, I got disciplined. I never got abused, never left a mark, but I, I sure enough knew that I, whatever mistake I had made, and really, it came down to this. We just kind of put it in a broad category. When I was disobedient to my parents, I didn't do what they told me to do, or I did something they told me not to do. When I was, this was a biggie. When I was disrespectful, particularly when I was disrespectful to mama. Disobedience and disrespect, those two were kind of the big, and so you, you made a mistake, and you got disciplined. And you got corrected. And hopefully, you didn't make that mistake again, or at least you didn't make that mistake too soon after that discipline. Maybe, maybe you, you forgot just how that went, and it was a while before you did that. And see, folks, this morning, as we think about discipline, we think about maybe the discipline that we have received from our earthly parents. Maybe we think about the discipline that, as a parent, that that you have meted out to your own children. And folks, we won't always get that right. There will be times in our life, to be sure, and two of the three, my three boys are here today, and they don't need to to respond to this, but if you were to ask them, they'd probably say, mom and dad got it right most of the time, but there was probably a time or two that they didn't. Pastor Chuck sharing with me this morning about a story that he was at school. By the way, when we grow up, if we got in trouble at school, I did not get in trouble at school because I did not want to get in trouble at home. But Pastor Chuck got in trouble at school one day. Teacher called up. It's good. Chuck's in trouble. Got Sure enough, he got home. I think it was the belt too. Not a little while later, the teacher called up and said, oh, I... I Actually, it was not Chuck. He, he, did, he didn't get in trouble. And, and now, now Chuck, Chuck did, so Pastor Chuck did something that I would never have done to my dad, but he did. He did. said, Dad, are, are you going to at least apologize for, for spanking me? I was not wrong. He says, no, I'm sure there was something that you have done wrong that that's for. Well, some, sometimes we get it and we don't deserve it. But folks, with God, he's a good, good father. Perfect in all of his ways. He is great. How, how great thou art. 
And he never makes a mistake. Oh, sometimes we think he's made a mistake. Sometimes we're like, what? Folks, well, this morning, as we read from Hebrews chapter 12, I-, I want you to just keep this in mind. Don't waste God's divine discipline in your life. Don't waste it. Don't, don't ignore it. Don't, don't reject. Don't, don't waste God's divine discipline in your life. Some of you have just come out of discipline. Some of you are in the midst of discipline. Some of you will be getting ready to go into discipline. As we grow older and we mature in our spiritual walk with the Lord, hopefully those times of discipline are fewer and farther between. But as we'll see in just a moment for the Christian, because we still live in this body and we still sin and we still make mistakes and we still mess up and we're still disobedient and we're still disrespectful to the Lord from time to time. Those times of discipline will come. And when they do, not if they do, but when they do, don't waste God's divine discipline in your life. For he gives it for a purpose and for a reason. If you have your copy of God's Word able to stand this morning, I invite you to stand as we read from Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 3 verse, through verse 11. The writer of Hebrews, just to set this up, writing to most likely Christians who came out of a Jewish background living in Rome. They were beginning to undergo more and more persecution. And many of these Jewish Christians wanted to go back to the old way of doing things. They wanted to go back to the sacrificial system. They thought, well, maybe if we just go back, we won't be uh, persecuted like this Christian group is being persecuted. And so throughout the book of Hebrews, you will find the writer of Hebrews over and over saying, you can't go back to the way things used to be. You have to keep going forward with Christ. Verse 3. Consider him, the him there is Jesus. Consider Jesus who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood. Verse 5, and have you forgotten the exhortation, literally the encouragement that addresses you as sons? And now he's going to quote from Proverbs, uh, from the word of God. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. And God is treating you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Father, we thank you this morning, and that even though it is not pleasant for the moment, Father, we thank you for your discipline that comes because of your love for us. Uh, Father, might we not waste uh, that divine discipline when it comes, but Father, might we see uh, your hand at work as you are shaping us, uh, knowing that it is for our good, and knowing that it is for our holiness, and ultimately for our righteousness. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and minds this morning, even those who may be undergoing discipline, even as we speak this morning, uh, that you would help us to see uh, the reason for that discipline, that we would not waste it. Uh, but that we would use it for uh, our good. Father, speak to us through your word. Might we have open hearts and open minds to understand and to apply all that you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Folks, folks similar to, to what we go through, we, we might lim- just kind of narrow this down uh, to the, the Hebrew Christians there in, in Rome uh, who were wanting to go back to the way things were. And simply they were being disobedient and disrespectful to the one who had come and, and actually had gone all the way to the cross. The, the previous verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, that, that we run the race uh, set before us. The one that Jesus Christ ran himself all the way to the cross of Calvary, despised the shame sat down at the right hand of God, all for the glory of the cross. And the writer of Hebrews says, you've not yet even begun to resist that kind of sin. And he says, consider him who endured, consider Jesus that hostility, so that you will not not grow weary or faint-hearted. Folks, don't waste God's divine discipline. One way that we waste God's divine discipline is simply this, we grow weary and faint-hearted in the midst of, of sin. 
And folks, we live in a sinful generation. Sin is all around us, and we can't help but be affected by that sin, and sometimes that sin gets the better of us, and sometimes we grow weary, and we grow faint-hearted, and we say, I can't withstand it, and we give in to that sin. The writer of Hebrews says, don't waste God's discipline by growing weary or growing faint-hearted. Don't ignore what God is doing in your life. Don't give up the fight against sin, and don't ignore God's divine discipline, not if, but when it comes. But sometimes we grow weary. Sometimes we can grow faint-hearted. Sometimes we can think, well, if we just kind of flew under the radar. If we just blended in like everybody else, maybe, folks, do not grow weary. Do not grow faint-hearted. Do not waste God's divine discipline in your life, particularly if you're in the midst of that discipline at this very moment. For you see, nobody thinks that in the midst of the divine discipline, that it, it's pleasant. Indeed, in verse 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Who wouldn't want to say, well, enough is enough. Please stop. Don't waste God's discipline. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan to conform you more to the image of Jesus Christ than you've ever been conformed before. He's got a purpose and a plan that through that discipline that he would not only correct the things that are wrong in your life, but that he would train you to be more righteous, that he would train you to be more in line with his son, Jesus Christ. Discipline is not just punishment, but it is ultimately correction, and it is ultimately for training in our life. Folks, there's not a single one of us here no matter how young or how old in our Christian walk, that does not still need God's divine discipline in our life. Don't waste God's divine discipline. Don't waste God's divine discipline by saying, well, I- I've made it. I-, I-, I no longer need any discipline. By the way, the-, the words that are used here for sons and for children are not just talking about infants. In fact, they're talking about adult children. They're talking about adult sons. And just because this word son is used, ladies don't think that you're immune from that either. I used the English Standard Version this morning. I thought about using the New Living Translation. But but I didn't use the New Living Translation this morning for this simple fact. It it translated the sons as children to be all-inclusive, meaning both men and women, sons and daughters. But instead of having father, it changed it to parent. Just this past week, the Episcopal Church in America debated the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer that they use in their liturgy, and the debate was simply this, that we're going to look at removing in the Book of Common Prayer the gender-specific language of God as Father. Folks understand Jesus himself in John chapter 4 said that God is spirit and that we worship God in spirit and in truth. But the same Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, told us when we pray, we pray thus, our Father, which art in heaven. See, we, we know God through masculine language. And not only do we know God through masculine language, masculine language, but Jesus, the Son, has actually instructed us, and we've not been given a counterman to that instruction. He has instructed us that when we pray, we pray to our Abba, to our Daddy, to our Father, and it does not matter what the book of common prayer says, because the book tells us exactly what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to pray. There will be some this morning who will say, well, you know, I, I used to be disciplined by God, but I, you know, I've not been disciplined in a long time. Or there might even be some here who say, you know, I, I can't even remember a time where I've had to be disciplined by God. Think about that just for a minute. I can't think of a time in my life that I've ever been disciplined by God. Now, at first blush, that might seem like, wow, wow, that's pretty good. But you think about that for folks. You think about children that grow up as 
infants and then toddlers and then they're in elementary school and then they're in middle school and then they're in high school and then they're out in the world and their parents have never ever disciplined them. Never, never corrected them. Never trained them. They'll, they'll find it out on their, we're just, I'm not really their mom or dad. I'm not really their parent. I'm just their, I'm their friend. I'm their best friend. I'm their buddy. Well, that's not the relationship we're to have with our own children. And that's certainly not the relationship that God has with us. He is not our cosmic buddy in the sky. He is God. Almighty, we just sang about this morning. He is our heavenly father. Yes, he wants an intimate, personal relationship with us in and through Jesus Christ. But to say that you've never, ever felt the discipline of the Lord is not a good thing it's actually quite a scary thing look back in verse 7 it is for discipline that you have to endure God is treating you as sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline if you are left without discipline in which all have participated then you are illegitimate children and not sons what's he talking about there he's talking about folks that look like they might be children of God but they're really not Because you see, our Heavenly Father will, in fact, discipline those who are His children. Think about it for a minute. You go go out to a restaurant. Maybe some of you go out to a restaurant today, you get ice cream at the end. (laughs) Or because it's National Ice Cream Sunday, you can get ice cream at the beginning. But, But just a couple tables down from you at the restaurant... It is a family that's eating with their children, and their children are a little bit older, so their children should know better if they have been trained better. And they are just, how shall we put this? Holy terrors. You been there? Been in that restaurant with that family? And, and you, it takes everything in you. It takes every ounce of self-control to not stand up from the table that you are seated at. Sit at, I like that. That you're seated at, we'll, t- <laughs> we'll take every ounce of self control to not stand up from your table and to walk over to that other table and go, well, if you won't discipline your kids, then I will. Now, we don't do that for a number of reasons. Probably the top of the list because we have these people in our society that are called lawyers but we we would want it my kid's not going to do that i'm gonna there's something about your kids there's something about discipline your kids they're yours and yeah they're at somebody else's but you're going to discipline your that's what god does with his kids he disciplines them. And if you're here this morning, you say, I, I can't ever remember a time where I've ever been disciplined by God. But then you simply need to stop and ask yourself the question, are you truly one of his kids? Have you truly been born again? Have you truly been adopted into his family? So once you're adopted into his family, you're there for, for life and all eternity. But, but if you've never experienced the discipline of Almighty God, then you better stop and ask yourself, yep, am, I, am I really his child? Am I, am I really his son? Am, am I really his daughter? Because God will discipline us as his children. That time will grow perhaps further and further apart because as we mature in our faith, uh, our sins and, and mistakes are, are not as often, but make no mistake about this, God will discipline us. Don't waste God's divine discipline by thinking that no divine discipline is a good thing it simply is not we will never entirely cease in our struggle with sin until we get to heaven and so because of that god will lovingly give us his divine discipline when we need it not if but when we need it don't waste god's divine discipline lastly by refusing to submit to god's divine discipline Look back in verse 9. Besides this, the writer says, We have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? 
Sometimes we, we waste God's divine discipline by simply refusing to submit to, to what he has in store for us. He disciplines us and we either complain about it. He disciplines us or we reject it outright. He disciplines us and the writer said we regard it lightly. What does it mean to regard God's discipline lightly? It means this, we simply are not going to be subject or submissive to whatever he's going to give to us. And think about it this way. You ever had times in your life where your parents disciplined you? Maybe, maybe they spanked you. Maybe they thought that the spanking really hurt. And you kind of just, you, you put on the show like the spanking really hurt. And they walked out the door. And what'd you do? <laughs> that didn't hurt. <laughs> they thought that hurt. That didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. What'd you, you regarded the discipline of the Lord lightly. There are times in our life where we can waste God's divine discipline by regarding it lightly, by complaining about it, by being angry at him, or by, in fact, further rebelling against his authority to the point that he needs to give us even more divine discipline. Israel in the Old Testament is a perfect example of that, that every time out of love he would discipline Israel there were many times where they just kept going further and further and further away from the Lord. Don't waste God's divine discipline. But you see, we, we have a choice every day to either, either submit to his divine discipline or not. There's a matter of life or death, blessing or curse. Shall we not much more be subject what to the Father of spirits and live to have life? For you see, God disciplines us not because he wants to take things from us, but because he wants to give good to us. For he is a good, good father. And there's a purpose and a reason for his discipline. But folks, how we respond to that is entirely up to us. How we respond when he disciplines us is entirely up to us. Moses put it this way in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. One of the last things that he said, recorded in Scripture, he said, I'll call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them. Uh, folks, don't miss what God wants to give to you and to me as we submit to his divine discipline. It is for our good, not for our bad. And, and in verse 11, as we conclude this morning, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields what the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And we are to be trained in righteousness. And so when God gives us discipline, it is for our good, it is for our holiness, and ultimately it is that we are to walk rightly before for him, to see him as holy and lifted up, to have the obedience and respect and reverence that he and he alone is entitled to. Folks, this morning, it's not a matter of if, it's, it's a matter of when. When you're in the midst of discipline from God because of his love for you and for me, do not waste his discipline. God, what is it that you have for my life? Why is it that I'm going through what I'm going through? And might we see the other side, what God has in store is greater than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Our life is in him. Today, don't waste what God wants to do in your life, even through discipline. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning. Uh, thank you for those times where you do lovingly bring discipline into our life. Not, not pleasant for the moment, but the results that it yields, the fruit of, of righteousness, holiness, 
goodness. Father, you are good all the time, all the time you are good. Father, help us never to forget that. That even in the midst of discipline, that you are shaping us, that you are training us, that you are correcting us, that you are encouraging us, that you are lifting us up for better things yet to come. And Father, I pray this morning, For those who are here, that they, even in this moment, would take just a moment to know that they know that they know that they are your kids, to know that they are sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that they have truly been born again by grace through faith, that not of themselves, that they have repented and believed the gospel and You have come into their life to take up residence with them, adopting them into your family, never kicking them out, never letting them go. But Father, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here who is simply not a son or daughter of the king, maybe they are a member of the church, maybe they've been baptized, maybe they serve, maybe they give, maybe they teach, maybe they deek, maybe they pastor, maybe they go and share the message, it does not matter. All of those things are good, but without Jesus, they simply will be in vain. So, Father, I pray this morning that even today you would confirm in each and every heart that they are your child. And if not, that they would come to faith, repentance this morning. Father, your spirit moves. Whatever it is that we need to deal with, whatever response that we need to give, even this morning to get our lives in check with you. Whatever it is that we need to surrender and lay down at the feet of Jesus, lay at the cross. Maybe we've laid it down before, we picked it up, and today is a new day. The morning has broken, today is a new day of mercy, and maybe today is a, a day of laying that back down and say, God, I, I don't want to pick it up again, but I, I'm laying it down today. And Father, whatever it is that we need to surrender, might we come to you this morning in repentance, obedience, and faith in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand.